Greetings. Welcome to Two Days Denarius. I'm Ron Thomas, the great minister of the Westminster Chapel from years ago, Martin Lloyd-Jones, once said, read sermons, but make sure they were published before 1900. Read the sermons of Spurgeon and Whitfield and Edwards and all those giants. Those men themselves read the Puritans and were greatly helped by them. On a larger spectrum, Martin Lloyd-Jones was saying, read classics because the things you're going to read in modern times aren't going to get it done for you. And you know, Jonathan Edwards echoed that uh, same type of thought because when he wrote the journal of David Brainerd, and we are going to cover David Brainerd and the unintended consequences of the life of David Brainerd, and that will be part one today. Uh, but Edwards wrote that there are two ways of representing and recommending true religion or true Christianity and virtue to the world, which God has made use of. And one is by precept and doctrine, and the other is by instance and example. Both are abundantly used throughout Scripture. Basically what he's saying is that through the Bible we understand Scripture, we understand what God is saying to us, one is by doctrine, which we know is teaching, training, and the other is by examples in scriptures of events or people's lives. Consider the lives of Moses, David, our Lord and Savior, uh, while he walked on the earth, the apostles, and certainly many other characters. Go through the book of Judges. Uh, we see some who did it well. We see others who failed. Uh, much in scripture uh, of those examples that lead us uh, to godly lives. And he went on to say, and from time to time, he has raised up eminent teachers to exhibit and bear testimony to the truth in their doctrine and to oppose the errors and the darkness of wickedness in this world. So in scripture, we see that demonstrated in the New and the Old Testament. Think about Isaiah and the challenge to the 450 false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in the Old Testament. Or think about times that Paul had to counter, in one particular instance, uh, a demonic, a female who was, uh, who was demon possessed. So there are many times we see in scripture encounters uh, such as this, where great people of God had to stand up in a gap and certainly manifest the power of God, as we kind of do in our time as well as we follow the Lord. So in that sense, he was speaking of, the, of scriptures. And then this is what Jonathan Edwards said after all that. He said, such an instance we have in this excellent person whose life is published in the pages before us. He is speaking of the example of the life of David Brainerd. So let's go ahead and get into this part three of the life of David Brainerd today. The unintended consequences of the life of David Brainerd Part one, I'm Ron Thomas. Welcome to Two Days Denarius. Let's get started. Welcome back to Two Days Denarius. Edwards went on to write in his book about, uh, and he put together a remarkable compilation, and not in the sense of what many uh, books on the history of a life of somebody had to deal with, you know, just dealing with their facts and doesn't always feel personal, something that was, uh, it was gripping that would really uh, touch your heart in unique ways. But he wrote not only about the facts that took place, but inside this journal, you really see the unique heart of a man who gave his full devotion uh, to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to say up front that David Brainerd wasn't perfect, and he would be the first person to tell you that he was perfect. He often was in such melancholy and often felt uh, like that he failed God, that he was a sin. He always dealt with mental health issues, with his severe depression. So I'm not saying that. He, he had great struggles. But through all those discouragements, with all those challenges, it seemed like his life was a victorious Christian life, a life that was one, at least that the great Jonathan Edwards said, was an example 
of the Christian life, one that he was trying to teach his own congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts, and as to how the Christian life ought to be lived. So before we get into that, uh, I do want to say, you know, um, I am thankful over the last month we've had a surge uh, in subscribers. Uh, that's a wonderful thing I'm very thankful for. Um, I'm at 93 right now. My prayer is uh, to make 100 subscribers uh, before the end of the year. Um, at this pace, it's very possible. And, you know, I don't take donations on this channel. I want to say up front, and bear with me for a moment, that my channel is about biblical teaching. I know my lessons are longer than many other channels out there, but there's a reason for it, and there's a good reason for it. And why I say that is I will not shortchange on teaching of the Word. I'm not going to shortchange on teaching about the lives that are exemplary Christian lives that we can draw inspiration from as certainly models on how to live this Christian life. So I am a full believer in Scripture, inerrancy, infallibility. It is our only rule of faith and practice. So I want you to know that I do the best I can uh, to follow the teachings of the Word of God. Um, and I actually do, by the way, read the Word of God. I'm going to talk about the Mur Robert Murray machine plan because his name is in this lesson. And that's the Bible reading plan that I use annually and probably have done that for over 30 years. So you're looking at a guy who reads his Bible every year. And uh, I believe this word it has been the joy of my life to look forward each day to reading the Word of God, especially in the mornings. It's the best time to do it. Uh, but having said that, if you, I don't ask for donations. Um, I can't say I won't set up a donation offering type setup in the future, but the best thing you can do to help this channel grow, one is subscribe, two is to like, three is to share, uh, and the other one is, you know, give it about a 20 minute listen or so because the YouTube algorithm now does take a closer look at um, algorithm by the amount of time that a video is watched. So you can just do those things. A nice thing about YouTube, you can also watch a video for a while. You can come back to later. It'll, it'll pick up right where you left off. And I want my lessons to be valuable. I want them to dig deeper than many of the other channels out there. Many of them aren't even teaching channels. Discerners most of the time is just tearing down somebody else's ministry. And you know, I'm going to grant it, I'll say some of those deserve to be critiqued, <laughs> for want of a better word. But in my channel, I'm devoted to teaching based uh, for the purpose of edification or for spiritual growth. And I do believe in giving warnings, and sometimes I give them on my channel. But at the same time, we need to be nourished spiritually, and that's what I do, and that's most of what my channel is dedicated to. So thank you for letting me pause and talk to you, because I want to give people an explanation of what my channel is about. And you know, I don't want you to be discouraged if you see a lesson that I give that's an hour long. Um, just split it up. Uh, just split it up, because I save a lot of good content for, for the end of my videos two-thirds of the way through my videos, there's always something there for you to learn from and you to grow by. So if I don't do that, then I'm not doing my job very well. But thank you. For, I'm very thankful for all of you who watch. I want you to know that. And doing this video on David Brainerd, one of my faith heroes, you know, we'll close off on this on my next one. But for now, I think it's worth looking at the lives and what happened with Jonathan Edwards' work. In editing David Brainerd's journals, he was writing that for all Christians to be a model of how to live the Christian life. But what happened from it, <laughs> one of the biggest unintended consequences of him writing this journal was the certainly the boom that many great ministers were called of God through reading this book, either went into the ministry or especially in regard to mission work. And we're going to take a look at many of them in this lesson. By definition, unintended consequences uh, are outcomes of a pers purposeful action that are not intended or they're not anticipated or not foreseen. Uh, you know, sometimes in military we talk about un intended consequences because one action that was supposed to do one thing 
may have succeeded or may have failed, but it brought something else that was completely unexpected. Uh, it could be it happened in a battle. It could just be it, it could be it's just a consequence of your own daily life. Uh, some of the things we do, uh, you know, it's like the action has a reaction, or the action has an unforeseen action. That's kind of what unintended consequences were. Now, in David Brainerd's case, there's this is every bit of an unintended consequence uh, that that you might want to see. So, in Jonathan. Edwards' efforts to create the ultimate manual for how you and I, or the people of his time and his congregation, should live the Christian lives. Others got a hand, hands on us. And by the way, you know, from the time this book was written, even to now, and this is like 1826 copy, around 1830, I know it's somewhere in that area. It's kind of brittle on the sides. I got to take care of it. But this is a treasure to me. It's a gift from a for, former colleague of mine. And I love it. I, I can't open this book and so much read it because it is a little bit old. But you can get David Brainerd's journal today uh, through Banner of Truth Publishing. Uh, as you can see in the picture there, I encourage you to get this book and read it. I will warn you ahead of time for about the first 50 pages or so, you'll, you'll sit there and think to yourself, this is about the most dis depressed person I've ever heard about in my life or read. Uh, you know, it'd be that way. I was like that too. But boy, I'll tell you what, the rewards come with the reading. Just, just keep on reading. You know, it's remarkable uh, what comes out of it if you, if you just persevere. But please get a copy. It's, it's a book well worth reading. So Jonathan Edwards' main intention was that this book be a manual for how the Christian life, what the Christian life ought to look like. And um, that it wound up becoming one of the greatest tools for missionary and ministry recruiting in the history of Christianity uh, for many, many years. And many, those who read it today, you cannot read the journal of David Brainerd and not be affected by it somehow. So what I, right now we are going to take a look in a journey through great men of Christian past and see who exactly was affected by reading the life uh, reading about the life of the Reverend David Brainerd. All right, number one, let's talk about William Carey. If you don't know the name of William Carey in evangelicalism, I, I can't see how you wouldn't have heard about it sometime. He is known as the father of modern missions. Uh, he was a missionary to India, but before that, he was appointed as a schoolmaster around 1785 in um, village of Moulton. I can't remember, that might be England. Uh, he certainly, I don't think, was uh, from here. But uh, he was invited, ultimately, to be a pax pastor of a local New Testament church. But during that time he was a pastor, he started reading the journal of David Brainerd. And he also read another one about an explorer, uh, uh, David Cook, who was a Christian missionary. And he started becoming concerned about the propagation of the gospel, not just here, but he was starting to think wider. And then he read about the missionary, uh, the missionary exploits of one John Eliot, who was a missionary uh, about over 100 years before uh, David Brainerd came along in that New England colony area. Uh, his years were 1604 to 1690. He was a Puritan missionary in the New England area. And then he read the journal of David Brainerd. And after that, they became canonized heroes to him. And in Kindlers, they, they, he was already saved, but they lit up his knife and he felt another calling on his own uh, journey of faith. So, so he became pastor around 1789, uh, full-time Harvey Lane Baptist Church in Leicester. If I didn't say that word right, forgive me. Three years later, in 1792, he published one of the most famous works of his era it's titled an inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathens and that means basically for the lost the lost people of of the nations so William Carey started setting a site he, he was called he eventually became a missionary to India for over 40 years never took a furlough by the way uh, and actually suffered greatly on his years, but he had a full ministry 
but he certainly had great challenges uh, along the way. He's famous for this one phrase also. It's uh, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Wow, why well, is something missing in our evangelical lingo today? Expect great things from God, attempt great things from God. I think we've gotten too comfortable in our fashionable Christianity in America. We're not going out. Only 3% three, only 3 of missionaries that go out today are going to people that have been unreached. Only 3%, did you get that? Only 3% of missionaries going out today, we're sending out, are going out to areas where people have never heard the good news. That's not, that is not good. Not good at all. But he is still called today the father of modern missions. Then there's another man called Henry Martin. <clears throat> Henry Martin is a very famous name in the Anglican church. Uh, he died young. He died around the age of 31. Uh, he was a missionary to India and to Persia, uh, served from 1806 to, to 1812. Um, he had intended to go into law, but during that term, uh, he sat under the preaching of a famous man named Charles Sin uh, Simeon. And I read the, the bio, biography of, of Charles Simeon, and it's incredible. It was in a book in the Swan series by, by John Piper. Uh, but Charles Simeon affected many people to become Christians or uh, to go into ministry or mission work. Uh, he was a very godly man. Um, but in the process of time, he read the journal of David Brainerd, the missionary to the Native Americans. He resolved to become a missionary himself by the influence of this journal. In fact, this is what Martin said about this journal. While pursuing the life of David Brainerd, his soul was filled with a holy emulation of that extraordinary man, and after deep consideration and fervent prayer, he was at length fixed in a resolution to his example. And you know what? He, he actually had a lot of health problems. He also had a journey of around six to seven years in mission work like David Brainerd, and he, he died young. And one of his famous quotes was, let me burn out for God. Let me burn out for God. You know, that's essentially what David Brainerd did. You know, we, we have a lot of Christians talking about having fun in churches and all this stuff. You, you don't see this kind of thing in our churches these days. This is why one of the reasons why my channel exists. I hope you are being blessed. I hope you're seeing that you and I can reach a closer and a higher calling in the Lord. But you know what? we got to accept the challenges that come with that. Following the Lord can bring great challenge, my friends. And if you and I want to burn out for God, or if you and I want to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God, we must have a greater faith and we must accept the challenges, uh, certainly, that come along with it. Now let's talk about one of my favorites, too. Robert Murray Machane. Robert Murray Machane died at the age of 29. Uh, he was a pastor uh, in Dundee, Scotland. He lived from 1813 to 1843. Uh, I actually have read his memoirs uh, by Andrew Bonner, uh, who was a ministry. It's a very, very great, it's a great book to read. It was so inspirational too. It's, it's about as inspirational and, and spiritually building up as uh, the life of David Brainerd's book is. Uh, but Robert Murray Machane had always had health problems. He wanted to go be a missionary himself, but his health wasn't going to allow it. Uh, allow it. But after the reading the journals of David Brainerd, Henry Martin, and some others, they fanned a newly kindled flame in him, and he devoted himself unreservedly to the work of the Lord. I mean, this is the, the effect uh, that the book had on Robert Murray Machane. And here's what he said. I often pray, Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be made. Often, I would like to depart and be with Christ to Mount Pisgah's top and take a farewell look at the church below to leave my body and to be present with the Lord. Ah, it is far better. But see, he fought through this. The reason that you hear that prayer is because he fought through many illnesses 
uh, and his ministry in Dundee until he passed away. But one of the significant things with Robert Murray Machane, uh, he always wanted a, ri a revival in his church, and he always prayed for it. And at the time, late in his life, uh, he took a mission missionary trip to Israel. And while he was gone, the minister who had stepped in for him saw revival happen. Literally, a, a wonderful revival took place while he was in India. Now, he wasn't upset about that. He rejoiced in that when he came home. But, you know, he certainly had his dream and his hopes uh, to see that. I'm sure he would have rather have been present, but still, God worked greatly uh, in that as a result. But, what, uh, you know, one of the things that really strikes me about Robert Murray Machane, and it is said of him that when he walked in, when he walked in and to take his seat, uh, either in his pew or, or up on the podium area, uh, people would start crying. I mean, just at his very presence, people were struck in their heart uh, when David, I mean, sorry, when Robert Murray Machane showed up. Speak of, think about that. You know, this man was such a pillar in the church of God. When people looked at him, not everybody cried, but, but there were known there that, that there were people who were breaking down when they saw Robert Murray Machane. What an influence. What, what brought that? What, what caused that to happen? You've got to think about that. You've got to think about a man whose walk with Christ was so close that it would affect others in this way. I want to ask you pastors here. Let's take a moment. What, what do you think people see when they see you? Are they just thinking you're their best buddy? Is that supposed to be that way? Or... Do they see you and have such respect for you that it makes them think about their lives and what they need to do to get right with them because you're preaching the Word of God the way it should be preached? Something to think about. There was a reason why people were influenced and impacted by Robert Murray Machane's life. He died at 29 years old. This is not a man who had a 50-plus year ministry like Charles Simeon had. But he had a great effect, and his, the effect of his life, like David Brainerd's, spread out wide after he was gone. Nobody knew about Robert Murray Machane until it came about where others like Andrew Bonner wrote about him, or people read his works. And I've read some of his. They're, they're wonderful. And they're very well worth reading. You can get some of those things for free on Apple Books um, and on Kindle. You can get some of Robert Murray Machine stuff, and it is just out of this world. I love reading his writings. And one of the great things, too, about Robert Murray Machine, and I mentioned this earlier, earlier, the Robert Murray Machine Bible Reading Plan. This is one of the great things he did in service to the evangelical church. Basically, what this Bible reading plan is, uh, it takes you through the Bible in one year. And the Old Testament you read through once, the New Testament and Psalms you read through twice a year. So if I've been using this uh, plan for 30 years now, I've done at least, and that might be a conservative figure, um, then I've read the Old Testament 30 years, but I've read New Testament and Psalms uh, 60 times in all those years. Nothing better than reading your, the Word of God, friends. I mean, it's a way to start the day. It's something that enhances our growth, our understanding. If you want to be able to understand what's happening in this world today and see the difference between what's false teaching and what's true, it's your job to be reading the Word of God. There is nothing in it that says, oh, it's only up to my pastor to read Scripture. That's not true. That's in your hands, too. That's in my hands, too. If I'm to be faithful as a minister myself, if I'm going to get on here and talk about all these things with you about spiritual growth and why you ought to do it, or if I'm going to teach you, I better know my stuff. I better have, have done my study. Yeah, I'm responsible, but uh, friends, let's be honest. Get on Google. Get on Google. Search Robert Murray Machine Bible Reading Plan. Robert Murray Machine Bible Reading Plan. Start using it. Start using it now. You need 
to be grown. You need to be fed. Yes, going to church and listening to the teaching of the word in the congregation is one way. But the other way is getting alone with God and reading the word, and letting him show you from his word the things he wants to put into your heart. I can't encourage it more. I really can't. Robert Murray Machane is one of my faith heroes, unquestionably. I guess it's a significant one, and I, he's going to come back later, probably on next video. But John Wesley, of all things, and John Wesley, I was like, wow. John Wesley is interesting because his theology is much different than David Brainerd's. Well, here's what he said. John Wesley, let every preacher read carefully over the life of David Brainerd. He said more, too, and I'm going to save that for the last one because... I really like what he said in the second part of this, and to speak to how, what, how, how David Brainerd's life should affect you and me. Let every preacher read carefully over the life of David Brainerd from the great John Wesley. You know what's significant? This is anecdotal. <laughs> this is a funny one, really. John Wesley did not agree with Jonathan Edwards' theology. He was what's called Arminian, and I'm not going to go on a lesson. That, that's a long lesson in and of itself. And John, Jonathan Edwards uh, was Calvinistic. So those two theologies have generally clashed through the ages since the uh, 16, 15 to 1600s on forward. And, but here is John Wesley encouraging readers. And, and this, is enough, this is not a volume on Calvinism. This is about a man in his life, his feelings, what happened, his journal, which displays such an amazing heart for God. Well, John Wesley saw that. But what was the funny part of it was, anecdotally, was John Wesley made sure not to put the forward. He took the forward that Jonathan Edwards wrote <laughs> before, in front of the book to read the journal. You have Jonathan Edwards writing about it. But I don't know why he did. There's a lot of valuable in information. If you ever read the life of David Brainerd, make sure you read the front part, make sure you read the foreword written by Jonathan Edwards. Because uh, what I talked about right initially there about how by scripture, um, how we grow in the faith is either by doctrine or by examples, uh, such as lives of great saints, uh, that's right there, that's right at the beginning of that. So I don't know why Wesley took it out, but he did. But what Wesley did there, he distributed the stories to all of his societies. He wanted to make sure everybody knew he had an opportunity to read about this man's life because he saw great value in it, obviously, and it impacted his life. Goodness, I think the man's responsible for the horseback riding and preaching over 12,000 sermons in his lifetime. And not only that, but this man, when he got old, was upset because he can go out, could not go out and preach as much anymore because he didn't have the strength, and he was upset about that. John Wesley was a remarkable man. <laughs> All right, but here's some other names affected by the, the Journal of David Brainerd. F.W. Robertson, uh, Keith Falconer, A.J. Gordon, Francis Asbury, great Methodist, Jim Elliott, missionary I've talked, to, talked about many times uh, on this channel. William Carey and Henry Martin were all motivated to service through David Brainerd and amongst other inspirational lives that they, uh, who they read about. And let's go on and continue with some names here. Names that you may hear or may, maybe names you do not know, but maybe in times you can start looking up some of these names for yourself and see some of the great things they accomplished for God and many of them through the inspiration of what they learned from the life of David Brainerd. Of course, another one from Scotland was Robert Morrison, uh, John Mills in America, Frederick Schwartz of Germany, David Livingston of England. You know, one of the famous movies, I can't remember when it came, probably in the 1950s, was a movie about David Ling Livingston he was from England, but he went to Africa. Uh, he's famous for being a missionary uh, in that con uh, continent, I think especially around the Congo area. Uh, but there's a movie written, a movie about him, an old one, and I love it. it I think the movie was called Living Stanley and Livingston, 
Uh, it tells the story. Stanley was a lost man. He was a journalist, but he later became a Christian, I believe, because of the influence of David Livingston. And he went out on the search for David Livingston because he went to the mission field. He just disappeared. Hadn't been heard from, heard from for years, and many thought he was dead. But Stanley found him, if I remember in the movie, right? It's an incredible story. Uh, so, um, David, but David Livingston, inspiration from the life of David Brainerd. Uh, we have Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray, you read a lot of books of him about prayer uh, stuff. You can, you can purchase Andrew Murray books today. Hey, by the way, they're better than anything that's out there today. I would encourage you to read. Uh, I think he wrote a book titled With Christ in the School of Prayer, Andrew Murray. Don't read things written after 1900. This one was written before it, okay? Like Martin Lloyd-Jones says, take of his advice. Read Andrew Murray with Christ in the School of Prayer. And he wrote other books on prayer and other topics too. So we have that gift. Inspired by the life of David Brainerd. Jim Elliott, again, missionary I talked to many times. He and his five friends gave their lives in the 1950s, trying to reach an unreached tribe in Ecuador, the Alcas. They lost their lives in their first attempt to make face-to-face -face contact with them. Let's go ahead and add Keith Green to that as well. The, before uh, the David Brainerd series, or right in the middle of it, I, I should say, um, I had been doing those Keith Green videos. And according to Leonard Ravenhill, who was a ministry mentor for Keith Green, he stated in a documentary that Keith benefited from reading and Keith, was, after he became a Christian, could, he would read anything he would, could get his hands on. He loved Charles Finney. He also loved reading the biography uh, of David Brainerd. So even Keith, even, you know, we lost Keith 40 years ago. But what I'm trying to say is throughout the time after his life in this journal was published, it continues to affect uh, many and many ministers to this day. Famous England, England uh, a famous English minister named Thomas Chalmers. You can look up Thomas Chalmers, Google that name, and you'll find some good information on him as well. But he said, when reading such lives as those of Brainerd and Dotteridge, I have often stood amazed and can almost say, en say I'm envious of their power to sustain a real and spiritual intercourse with heaven for large portions of a whole day. You read the journal of David Brainerd, you often see accounts of him, especially on the Lord's Day, truly spending that day uh, with him in prayer, uh, in devotion uh, to him after conducting his ministries and reaching out uh, to the Native Americans or the Indians uh, of his time. Welcome back, and let's get ready to conclude this episode of Two Days Denarius. You know, I've had people say to me in the past that, uh, oh, I just read my Bible. I don't need to learn about anybody else. I don't need to learn anything. Uh, Bible's all I need. Well, the Bible is all you need. But guess what? There is something else you also need, too. Yes, sometimes we need to be encouraged by mentors in our faith. Look, you and I, Christians, we're, we're not free agents. We get our spiritual growth. It comes in multiple ways. It comes when we attend the local New Testament church and take part in hearing the word of God or being participating in the body of Christ. Uh, it does take place in our prayer times. It does take place when we read the words. It does take place when we're close or learn about and grow from either reading books about inspirational believers or those who are alive today. I say this in a kind way. Let us not kind of be prideful. I think that's a prideful statement because I'll be honest with you, many of those people have made that statement to me. Let us secret, they're not reading their Bibles. You didn't hear me. I didn't say that out loud. No, no. no, they're not. And you know it, two ways. One, kind of the way they live, advice they give and things like that. But, you know, some have. But to think that we can't, but they, they did have their own faith heroes too, by the way. Some of the people said that to me. Don't, don't think for a second 
that you can't gain value either from reading good books. Why do you think Charles Spurgeon was an off-the-charts preacher and became the prince of pre preachers? Charles Spurgeon didn't have a degree, folks. No. Oh, he was just so close to God. Well, what you don't know is Charles Spurgeon was always reading literature, especially Puritan literature. Charles Spurgeon, that's what goes back to Martin Lloyd-Jones' comment at the beginning of this episode. Because Spurgeon greatly benefited from the writing of the Puritans, which is why he became the minister that he became, even without a seminary or a college education. So I want you to know and look through scripture here. I'm going to build up here an answer to say it is very biblical for you and I to learn from the examples of others who have walked this Christian faith well. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. Imitators of God, absolutely. We're starting right there. It all starts, that's our foundation. He's our foundation. Be imitators of God, his beloved children. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And right after that, Paul in his writing to the Ephesians, it goes down and he, he gives lessons on how we are to live and practice this Christian life. The, what walking in love looks like, what living the Christian life looks like. This is the manual, absolutely. But the first thing we do, be imitators of God and certainly of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let's take another step. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Paul says this, Be imitators of me, just as I am also of Christ. If you guys, you Corinthians, your church is so messed up, and it sure was, read the first six chapters, you can't get it right? Follow my example. I have taught you by writing to you. I have taught you by living it before you, how you do this. So you get the step. Imitators of God, imitators of Christ. Paul says, you imitate me. I am an apostle. I am a true leader of the church. I know how to do this thing, and I'm trying to help you along. And Paul, Paul wasn't writing that out of any arrogance. Paul was writing that out of love because he wanted the Corinthians to succeed. He wanted to make sure his work was not in vain, and he said that to them. Now let's take a step over to Hebrews. Hebrews just gets a little clearer where I'm going. Hebrews 6, 11 and 12. And we desire, now we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, by the way, but whoever wrote it was known by the people who received this book. I think now more than ever in my life, it's very possible that the Apostle Paul wrote this. I mean, I don't know who in the world else out there could have had the knowledge that the Apostle Paul had to write such a, Marvelous, mysterious book. It's so fascinating. All right, but let's continue. Hey, quit interrupting me out there. <laughs> okay, and we desire that each one of you demonstrate the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and endurance inherit the promise. Hebrew, Christians, you're having some problems along the way. But realize your full assurance. Don't get sluggish in your faith. Follow the examples of those who you know and see are living this faith. That's what you want to do. Hey, these aren't the apostles he's talking about here. These are talking about people in the church who live their lives of faith before them, who live by their lives, or maybe they're people who teach among their congregations. But whatever, they know who they are. And they are to follow their example. They are to imitate what they do. Okay, you say, all right, I don't know if I'm 100% convinced yet. Well, let's look at one last passage. 3 John 11 and 12. There was a big problem in the particular church that John was writing to because they had a character in there, in Diotrephes, who the Bible says wanted to be preeminent in everything. First place, controlling individual. 
narcissistic, grade A, controlling individual. And in fact, he was so bad, he made malicious comments and accusations against the apostles, particularly the apostle John. But even after he said that, right after that, John notes someone. This is, this is beautiful. He notes somebody who did it right. Listen to what he says. 3 John 11 and 12. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. And by the way, that was the first thing he said after talking about Diotrephes. Because Diotrephes was evil. Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He's going to talk about somebody good here in a second. The one who does what is good is of God. The one who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony, testimony from everyone. I'm in a preaching mood now. Demetrius has received a good testimony, everyone. Think about your life, friends. Think about your life. What kind of testimony do you have? He's received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. Want to know why? Because we testify to you and to know, you know that our testimony is true. He lived the life of faith. His good testimony was known to everyone. And what did he say at the beginning? Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Demetrius was good. Demetrius was the good that John was talking about there. You know, in the church when I was young, we would talk about people who were pillars in the church. And the pillar sometimes could be a deacon. It could be a, a regular lay person. Uh, sometimes life, I've, I've seen uh, some women in the church who were considered pillars, pillar in the church. I know the church I attend uh, has one who'd worked children ministry for so many years. And she's considered a pillar in that congregation. And rightfully so. I remember when I was young, Brother Hartsfield. Boy, when you, you just looked, it was almost like a Robert Murray machine effect. Now, I never cried when I saw Brother Hartfield, but I always felt good when I saw Brother Hartfield. Because you know what I thought to myself? Man, there's a godly man I want to be just like someday. Do you have anybody in the church that you go to that you can look at and you say, that's a godly man whose example I want to follow? You know, I want to say to us, friends, if we can't find anybody like that in our times, so we'll, there's something to matter with us as a church. But I'm sure they're out there somewhere, and we need to find them. Let us not be arrogant and stuff to see that we, we are our own island and we carve our own path. That's unbiblical. We are to be part of the body of Christ. We are to be united with each other. We are to share each other. And we are to be godly in our behavior and the way we treat each other. And we are, of course, as our Lord commanded, to love one another. Let us imitate God the way we supposed to do it. We're supposed to do it, but let us also learn from others who live those godly lives that help lead us or inspire us to expect great things from God and attempt great things from God. Thank you, William Carey. That comes, that, that quote is so true and has much use in our lives if we want to live a walk of true faith. And you know, that word imitate, one thing I did want to tell you here is that it comes from the Greek word um, mimeomai, mimic. And you can see if you saw some other derivatives uh, in the con conjugations of this word, especially the verbs, uh, that it's clear uh, that our word mimic uh, comes from this particular word. It's just one who does it, uh, someone else or, or a group does. It's an imitation. Imitators. Well, we get mimic from it. And I just want you to know that, you know, this one word, four verses that I've read, or more than four, but four examples I gave you all use the same Greek word and it's all a word uh, of imitation. So I want to ask you, you know, when you, when you hear stuff like this, you, you hear about the un unintended consequence, uh, consequences of a godly man's life. How does that affect you? You know, I, if, if you really have any type of desire to know God, to follow God, 
Uh, one is I would recommend you know, and read the Word and certainly get a book like the Journal of David Brainerd and read it. Um, you'll be very much inspired and it, certainly you never know. Uh, God might put a desire or a calling in your heart to some type of special ministry. Uh, but you know you can't start there, friends. You know this is the altar call part. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? All the people I talked about in this particular episode today all had to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Some of them very dramatically. Uh, some of them underwent some very intense trials, came to faith in Christ. And what do I mean to that by coming to faith in Christ? Well, the first thing you need to know before you can come to Christ is you need to be delivered from your sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Sin has its consequences, and the fact of the matter is, when the Bible says that all have sinned, it means all. Yes, it means you too. All have sinned. We have a colossal sin problem. And sometimes when we hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit is there convicting us because we know that we have fallen short of the glory of God. The word harmartia, I may be off on my Greek here on that particular word, it, it, it kind of has the context of missing the mark, but it also has the context of our rebellion against God. Because we are. Unless somebody comes for us, helps us, we can't deliver ourselves from our sin. And that's why when I said, for the wages of sin is death, the other part of Romans 6.23 is, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's only one person who can save you, it's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father but through me. That sounds pretty exclusive. There is no other way to salvation but through Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes you see a John 3, 16 when you're watching a football game by the goalposts after a touchdown score. Somebody's putting a big John 3, 16 sign. Well, John 3, 16... It seems so simple but, simple, but it's also exclusive as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten or his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Greek word monogenes simply means unique, one of a kind. There is no other savior. Neither is there salvation in anyone else for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's Acts 4.12. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? You can't, e you can't even get started learning about a life of a godly man like David Brainerd without knowing Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You can read this journal and the way he walked and stuff like that. And uh, Can it be saved from the book? No, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It says over in the book of Romans, you have to hear this word, which I'm giving to you right now. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? It says in Romans 5 8, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's talking to believers there, but he, he dies for you if you receive him as your Lord and Savior. These are times that are hard. I believe Jesus Christ is going to come soon. And I'm now hearing that people have rapture anxiety about Christ's coming. Well, but you know what? Maybe the Holy Spirit's convicting them to get their heart right because Jesus is coming soon. And that's a fact. I really believe that. Where are you going to be? If you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, call on him. Admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you have fallen short of his grace and his glory. That you've sinned for him. Tell him that you... Thank you for him dying on the cross for your sin. Ask him to deliver you from sin, that you are now ready to give your life to him, that he to come in to be your Lord and Savior. The Lord means that he's going to be your owner and master. You're, you, you're changing clothes. You're moving from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Call him to come into your heart. And when you do, be serious about it and follow him. And after you receive Christ, your Lord Savior, look, if you get saved, you're going to know it. The Holy Spirit comes into your heart and he grips and he resides. You'll know it. And then after that, you get to a local New Testament church, 
a Bible-believing local New Testament church. And you get in there, talk to the pastor, tell them what happened in your life. And if they talk you down, oh, that didn't happen or whatever, then you find a different church. You can email me at 2DaysDenarius. My email address is on the website. It's on my web page uh, for 2DaysDenarius. I encourage you to send me an email if you come to know Christ because I can help you in that process. Uh, so please do that. And I can rejoice with you as well, help get you started um, in, uh, in those, this walk of faith. But I also want to say to you who aren't really doing, you know, hey, if Jesus were to come today, are you ready? Are you and I ready? Uh, well, are you serving the local church? What are you doing? Are, do you, are you one who thinks you're a free agent in this world? You think you can live for Christ on the golf course, which is totally untrue on Sundays? What are you doing? You and I got to pick up our game, my friends. We are living in a time where there's great apostasy and great infiltration of false teachers, even in our evangelical churches today. And what has to happen here is the true people of God are going to have to rise up. We rise up by prayer, and we rise up and be in there. At times we have to call out false doctrine, we do it. But I say to you, Christians, fellow Christians, uh, let's come together. Uh, let's come together, be ready, pray for our Lord's coming, and certainly pray uh, for the souls of the people on this earth so we can have and see a revival uh, in our times. You know what? Not far from the end of life, this man saw a revival. I believe it was in Quantumic, or Cross Weeksung. Cross Weeksung, which later became called Cross Wicks. Uh, David Brainerd, throughout all of the stuff that happened in his life, got to see a revival late in his life. What are you doing and I doing in our lives? What, what do you believe? What is God calling you to do? Christian, our first job is to see, Lord, what will you have me to do? Let us get it right again. And let us get on the right path. Let us be William Carey's, expecting great things from God and attempting great things for him. Well, next time we will cover more of the unintended consequence. I encourage you to listen to, watch this one definitely, because there's lots to be learned from this, this particular episode. But I do want to tell you, next time we're going to look at more unintended consequences that are really going to surprise you. One of which, to get you, put a little feeder out there for you, what a witch. I want to talk about the mystery of whether or not uh, David Brainerd and Jerusha Edwards were actually engaged or were actually going to marry. I have my thoughts about that. Uh, but I do, and I think I've looked good enough at the research to draw a pretty good educated conclusion from it. And uh, I'll talk about that next time. But believe me, some of the other stuff will fascinate you as well. And it will be the last lesson. Uh, in the David Brainerd series. So I do want to say thank you uh, for watching today's Denarius. It is always a joy uh, to bring these videos to you. And uh, you know what? I'm on year three now on my YouTube. I just passed it this month. October is a, is a good date for that. Um, and ex I'm excited about that. I'm making this video on October 8th, but if I release it on October 9th, um, I can't remember how many hundred years it is since the passing, but that is October 9th is the day that David Brainerd uh, passed away on the calendar. So I just realized that. <laughs> I just realized that as I'm making this video. All right, friends. Thank you for watching Two Days Denarius. Look forward uh, to you on here next time. And may God richly bless you.